Isn't that crazy? You got your active shooter training. This is safe uh, rooms inside your classroom. Yeah, you know we have uh, we have more deaths by firearm in the United States than any industrialized nation. Yes, uh, well, unfortunately, eighty percent of those stats are due to suicide. <laughs> um, yeah, but those are those are also the stats for uh, for um, homicides. Really? Yeah, we have the right. highest homicide by uh, firearm rate. I could I could see that. I could see that. It's just I hate it when people uh, conflate the numbers with uh, like because like people rattle off that stat mm -hmm. with the, the hundreds of thousands of death or or whatever it, the stat. Is. I don't even remember we we're talking about it on the podcast with Alzheimer's, but um, like literally over three quarters of them are due to suicide of sh of deaths by shooting. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the de uh, the stats are on homicide though, so. Yeah, so back in the studio, Jesse Weiss, Dr. Jesse Weiss, the sociologist. Environmental studies professor as well. Okay. Is it sociologist? Sociology. Sociology prof. Yeah. All right, yeah. So uh, you just had an incredible journey, like 34,000, 3,400 miles. Yeah, 34,000 be a lot. Speaking of conflating things. Yeah, so uh, we... Uh, uh, I guess we go back all the way to the uh, the class that I teach. So I teach a class on uh, the national parks at school uh, at the University of the Ozarks in Clarksville. And uh, so this was a, a class that I kind of conceived of when uh, I was on a road trip with my family, um, maybe like f six or seven years ago. We had a summer where we had like 100 straight days of 100 degree weather. I don't know if you remember that summer. Yeah, I think I was, um, well, okay, no, this wasn't that long ago. But I remember that's when they started running that special at the jewelry store. Like, if it's this degrees, if yeah. it's over 100 degrees on this day, on July 4th, you get your money back or it something. It was hot. It was really hot. I do so remember that year. We uh, basically decided that we need to go someplace where it's not going to be hot. And so we got on the weather map and looked at a place that was not going to be 100 degrees. And so South Dakota was uh was the place that uh that we found that we wanted to go to and so we packed up uh, packed up all my kids in our van and uh we drove up to uh, omaha nebraska and then up to sioux falls south dakota and then nice. across south dakota and went to the badlands and uh mount rushmore and uh, up to deadwood and on that trip i was just really kind of uh, struck by the um, the fact that my kids were old enough to notice that, you know, you go out of uh, Iowa and into South Dakota and then cross South Dakota and how drastically the landscape changes. Yeah. And I, have, I haven't been that far northward. No. Western. Um, it's, uh, well, I, you know, at one point, um, my family, before I had my family, lived up in, uh, up in Nebraska by the South Dakota border. So I had been up there before. But, uh, you know, we had some time to hang out at Badlands and go to uh, some of the, the places that are, uh, you know, really cool landscapes. Um, it's, you know, you come out of driving across South Dakota and it's like the high plains and then all of a sudden the landscape changes and you enter into this national park. And before that, I wasn't really, I hadn't really thought too much about national parks. Um, but then I started doing some kind of research on it and thought it was a really cool and interesting thing. Um, came up with this class that it would be a road trip class that we would kind of study the uh, the different uh, the different management strategies because that's one of my areas of uh, expertise is uh, kind of land uses. Um, with my background in, in environment and natural resource sociology, um, the different ways that humans interact with their physical environments and how definitions. Uh, influence the way that we behave and uh, govern and regulate. And so, uh, the, you know, my own research on national parks and, you know, kind of my training in, in some of those policy areas has sparked an interest. And uh, so I uh, created this class, uh, got permission to teach it, and we were going to study the history of the national parks. And we began with uh, delving into the cultural idea of wilderness and kind of what that means and how important it is to um, the idea of Americana. Um, and so we start with the symbolic part of it where wilderness kind of comes from this idea of uh, something that's not society, not man-made, something that stands apart from it and looking at how that idea has kind of shifted and changed uh, over the years from the early part of uh, 
um, the birth of our country to where we are right now, and then how that uh, definition of wilderness impacted and continues to impact the way that we we manage places that we consider to be special. Uh, so national parks, right? Um, so that was the general idea. And then at the end of the class, I wanted to take the students on a huge road trip and uh, just see some of the parks that we studied. So Is that this was, the first semester you taught it? No, I've taught this. This is the third time I've taught it. Sick. Yeah, I, th- I don't know if I told you. Um, we had a national park set. He actually moved and uh, taught at Liberty University. Mm-hmm. I made a joke about him yesterday because we were joking about how we were never going to stop training martial arts. And I was like, this professor made a j- like was like, you know, you can't do that forever. You're not just blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, dude. Who do you think I am? <laughs> <laughs> like it was while I was still in college and like he didn't, he didn't even then understand the scale of what we were doing. Mm-hmm. And this is like, oh man, six years ago or something, but he ended up moving, but he was a national parks guy. Him and Tom DeBlack, who's retiring this year, they're historians mm-hmm. though. They're, they're uh, obviously they're taking a lot different um, approach on it. There's a, is there, so is there like a Ken Burns documentary on national? There parks? is. It's a, it's a, like a, an eight or nine, our documentary yeah um, i think they just watched that yeah uh and it's really so that's a great documentary and it, it he does a, it. you know he does a really awesome job of uh, of kind of photographing and uh uh you know capturing on video and, and narrating and getting a lot of folks to do the narration and i've seen i think i've seen almost all of those um but yeah my perspective is historical because you have to look at the history of it and um you know when when i was uh when I was an undergraduate, I was history and social, sociology double major. Uh, so I definitely have a love for, for history. Um, and the history of the national parks is really interesting, too, because, um, you know, initially the, the whole idea was that we were uh, the, um, the folks that were really influential in, in uh, kind of setting in motion this thing that became the national parks. Um, they wanted to, uh, they wanted to preserve these places that were important and special so that they wouldn't be exploited, um, through private, private land ownership, uh, the way that, uh, places out East did like one of the, one of the examples of what not to do is, uh, the American side of, uh, uh, Niagara Falls, which was incredibly commercialized and kind of, uh, turned into more of a spectacle than a, than a preserve. Have you heard about this? Um, uh, there's like some sort of a, it's not a sea world. It's like a, uh, it's not called sea world, but I think it's on the Canada side. And, um, they have like a crazy mass graveyard for all, like like whales and stuff like no. they've had all of these incidents with like um I mean, it's they own all of this land around this uh, Sea World type of a park. Mm-hmm. It's called like Ocean World or something, you know, some kind of knockoff. Yeah, 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 it is. But um, I don't know what all the controversies around what was getting uh, the awareness has been getting raised. There was a guest on Joe Rogan that was uh, that talked about it, and um, he was a former employee there, and he was talking about all these incidents that had happened with dolphins and. Um, and the whales and stuff and dude this is super saddening but it's like right there in like the Niagara tourism that's where they make all their money right and and you'll see some of that at, at, at American National Parks too so if you uh, uh, on this first trip that we ended up going to we ended up uh, one of the, the big places we went to was Yellowstone right mm. uh, so our initial trip was going to drive up to South Dakota we're going to see the Badlands uh, we're going to see Mount Rushmore so you went into the Badlands? Yeah, we went into the Badlands, and we were supposed to uh, uh, we were supposed to kung fu fight people, but it just didn't happen. They, I saw a promo for that on the. I watched some of the UFC fights um, just last night. Uh, the ones that Conor McGregor ruined. The, the the real ones, not the fake ones. Uh, dude, I've just been like, you should see my last Facebook status. I shared a video, and I was like, there's no way I'm going to believe this is real. Yeah, no way. It's all fake. It's all a publicity stunt. And I think it's all a publicity stunt so they could like, I think they were going to have, they remain event fell through twice. And I think they were going to have to undo another fight to make the main event happen. So that scratches, you know, a fight there. And then I think a couple of other fighters had weight cut issues. And I think they were in a place where they were either going to cancel the event or lose a ton of money. Yeah. 
And I think if you look at it from a money perspective, it's like, well, we'll just come up with this. We're owned by an entertainment company now because uh, uh, Zoof has been, been bought out by an entertainment company for mm -hmm. $6 billion, which is a conglomerate of all of these. Um, Anthony Kiedis is an owner. And, That's a pretty nice profit. Yeah. I'd like uh, to sell anything for like, you know, $600,000 or six thousand dollars i think six thousand yeah yeah i mean really seriously yeah. i feel like i mean think of the upgrades we could do the studio with six grand it could be nice man you could have a producer behind a glass wall yeah for that yeah but uh yeah i didn't i didn't get a chance to watch any of the fights well yeah no they were advertising that into the bad I, I watched like the first episode but i couldn't really get into it i didn't get into it either um I'm, I like the 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 kind of the the genre crossing that they do with shows like that, uh, but it didn't it didn't resonate with me. Well, you know what is resonating with me, and I just talked about this in my class the other day. Um, so you met, you were mentioning uh, the the uh, idea of wilderness, the the concept, uh, and how how we probably view it. it's like dances with wolves, man. I know, right? Yeah, it's straight up. Well, so the really interesting thing about the uh, the concept of wilderness is it is it is uh, it is human created, right? Like uh, one of the examples that I use in my class is that for. Um, different species of animals. They just, they don't think about the separation between where I live and then where everything else is, which is, it's an arbitrary definition that's completely man-made and it's man-maintained, right? Other species are like, you know, this is just where I live and this is what I do. Uh, humans, you know, have kind of created this arbitrary juxtaposition between society and nature, right? And it's created uh, uh, these barriers that we've, uh, constructed that don't really exist where we see ourselves as separate and exempt from the laws of uh, ecology and the, that's uh, an interesting take I've never really uh, thought about it that but it's hundred percent true I mean we we it have, is. we have uh, we have buildings that we've made and we've created roads to get from point A to point B and we've separated ourselves from you know even where our food comes from I mean we go and get a hamburger we don't even call it a cow it's what it is right um, but so wilderness is this idea that is outside of uh, outside of uh, human civilization. So it's wild, uh, it's free. Uh, in the early days of our of our country, this idea of wilderness was very dangerous. Um, you know, especially as the the pioneers kind of follow their manifest destiny out west. Um, I mean, how many of us played Oregon Trail and died of things like dysentery and a broken limb? And did you ever play? Oregon Trail on was that was that before your time? I, I mean, I've it seems vaguely familiar, but I don't know. It was a real real low rent uh, computer game. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and you'd try you'd have to get from like Kansas City all the way to Oregon, but uh, at various points along the way, people in your party die, and uh, if you can't, if you, everybody dies, it's over. Um, so we had this uh, this attitude that that the the wilderness was something that that was dangerous and so uh, something that needed to be tamed and so that's the way that it was approached right as we make our way across this country we uh, we put fences around places we uh, put arbitrary boundaries around states um, we label things as cities versus the country urban versus rural and these are all human constructs urbanization yeah way we see uh, suburban sprawl yeah i mean we we get rid of trees we get rid of uh you know we 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 make it we civilize the world um but so as we're doing this we get to uh you know the uh the early 1800s and the mid 1800s people are starting to recognize that open spaces are disappearing uh not only is our technology getting better where we can we can take more of the the city with us to the country you know, uh, we get better at surviving out in wilderness. And uh, the thought occurs to us and our conception of wilderness shifts from something that we need to tame and something we need to get rid of to something that we need to protect. And so there's this uh, there's this really interesting guy uh, named John Muir. You're familiar with uh, John Muir. So John Muir is uh, he becomes the uh, he becomes really the grandfather of, of national parks. Uh, but his story is really interesting. So he is the son of uh, I think he was a Presbyterian minister, a uh, very disciplined gentleman. Go, go John Calvin. Yeah. I mean, he was uh, very much um, 
uh, very strict on John Muir, um, and uh, he made John Muir memorize the Bible. And so by the time that he was like 15, he had memorized the entire New Testament, and by the time he was 18, he'd almost memorized the entire Bible. I was working on that when we first met each other, Jason. Were you? I just... I How's that man. going for you? I, I backslid. I don't even know the, all the books of the Bible anymore. Dude, I remember when I like, uh, I was in a part of some like kids program at church and I had to memorize like the Old Testament and I was so proud, dude. I couldn't tell you today though. I don't, I used to know how many books there were and, but that was my upbringing. Yeah. You know, it was, it was Oh, this! I, I wish I like would have been knowing about national parks and stuff <laughs> instead. You know what I'm saying? Well, I mean, it can it can go together. You know, the whole God's creation thing. If that's uh, the direction you chose uh, choose to go, or if and, you're a deist, yeah, of course, yeah, it could be. Uh, you know, if you kind of uh, look at uh, you know spirituality in, in natural places and. Um, you know, kind of the way that it, a lot of indigenous people approach it. Um, you know that there's uh, that there's spirit in everything. Um, John Muir took that approach. It was really interesting because uh, when he was uh, became a, an adult, he started working in a, in a woodworking like apprenticeship and uh, spent a lot of time inside making things out of, I think it was wood. Uh, and he had, uh, it may not have been wood, it may have been some other industry, uh, but he had an accident, an industrial accident that took away his sight. Oh. And so he was blind for a period of time. And while he was blind for a period of time, he had this epiphany, like, why am I spending all this time uh, toiling away, doing all of these things and not paying attention to the world that's around me? And so when he healed from his injuries, uh, he, uh, he regained his sight and he decided that he was going to cast off everything uh, about society and he was going to walk all the way to uh, South America. Uh, so he got almost to Mexico and he got really sick, uh, didn't know why. Uh, we know now that he ended up getting bit by a uh, mosquito and got malaria. Uh, so when he healed up from that, he decided that his path wasn't south, but it was actually west. And he made his way all the way to California where he, uh, he discovered the Yosemite Valley um, and absolutely what, what fell in love with it. This was in uh, the mid-1800s. Um, maybe like the 1850s 1860s so did he just decide that there were too many mosquitoes down there yeah it was not he was not he wasn't he didn't want to go south anymore and so he went west and uh he discovered uh, uh yellowstone uh he actually actually went out there and, and started working for a timber company uh but he would be gone for weeks and months at a time and he would go out and just commune with nature um he became uh, one of the most prolific writers and uh, sold a bunch of his stuff to uh, magazines back east and was single-handedly responsible for uh, creating enough sentiment where they, uh, the state of California created uh, one of the very first protected wilderness areas in, in the United States in the world. Um, later on, he would become a really well-known advocate for protecting uh, natural places, so much so that uh, President Teddy Roosevelt made the journey out to California. I was just thinking about Teddy when you said malaria. Yeah. Uh, Roosevelt made the way uh, out to uh, California, and they allowed uh, John Muir to take Teddy Roosevelt in the woods for three days. Can you imagine that today? Like some crazy eyed dude with a big long beard who likes to uh, hang out in, uh, in the woods taking the president out that would never be allowed today um, kind of on the uh, on the heels of that we start this kind of national idea that uh, there are certain places that are so important that are so inspe uh, so special that they have to be protected and it was really so and he was he was probably the first person to convince someone of uh most importance who could make those types of decisions for our country yeah that. absolutely and what's really cool is that guys like muir through his his writing his poetry m-u-i-r and there are pictures of him and he's crazy eyed he looks nuts he's got like long stringy hair and a big old beard and he's got these eyes that seem like they've seen things you yeah. know, uh, but he was incredibly. Yeah. I mean, he's doesn't he look nuts? Yeah. He looks oh, nuts. there. He is a Teddy. Would you let the, would you let the president go out with him? I don't know about that. <laughs> probably not. I can imagine the secret service. I imagine Teddy Roosevelt probably could handle himself. He's like a Robert Frost, man. Look at he him. Is. His walking stick. He is. So he, uh, he would go out. There's this really well-known story of John Muir where he wants to experience what it's like to be in a thunderstorm uh, from the perspective of a tree. So he would uh, climb trees in the middle of a thunderstorm just to see what it was like. 
Um, he would Paul climb. Stamets did that once, but he was on like 20 grams of mushrooms or something. I don't think that he was on mushrooms. I think he was just like uh, high on life maybe, but he was nuts. He was crazy. John Muir was crazy. Uh, but he instilled this idea that these are places that should be protected. Um, interesting story about John Muir is that he was successful in, in protecting the Yosemite Valley, but there was a valley just north of there that he liked better. It was called the Hetch Hetchy. And uh, it, was, uh, it was set to be, there was this river that ran through the valley and was set to be uh, dammed uh, for a reservoir um, to provide water for, I believe, Los Angeles. Um, and uh, he was he was unable to, to successfully have that place designated. And so as a result, he left California and went and moved to Alaska. So he, it, he was so upset about it that he left the place that he loved and moved to Alaska where he Man. basically passed away. Um, but that was really the beginning of it. Right. And so in, uh, in, in, uh, what is it? 1872, we have the very first designation of a national park, which is Yellowstone. Um, and uh, from there on, we have, you know, we've kind of added to it. There are 59 different national parks. Now How many have you States. went to? So I've been to, um, gosh, I have a patch for every one of them. Dude, yeah. So what's, what's this jacket? So I have here? my jacket here. So, uh, and this also includes national monuments and uh, uh, also some, some uh, like wilderness areas. So uh, let's see. I have the Grand Canyon. Uh, the North Rim. I have the Canaveral National Seashore, which is in Florida. Uh, Mount Rushmore National Monument, South Dakota. I have the North Rim of the Grand Canyon. Uh, I've got the Grand Staircase in Escalante, a national monument that uh, the uh, administration uh, for the United States has, has seen fit to uh, reduce the size of in Utah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We should talk about that a little bit more in a second because I, I, would, I bet you know more about it than I do and a lot of listeners do. Yeah, uh, and then Hot Springs here in Arkansas, uh, the Badlands National Park, Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado, Arches National Park in Utah, Guadalupe Mountains National Park. I've got Bryce Canyon National Park in Utah, Canyonlands also in Utah. I've got Yellowstone, uh, which is up in Wyoming, Great Sand Dunes, uh, which is in Colorado. I've got Capitol Reef National Park also in Utah, Petrified Forest National Park in Arizona. I've got uh, Zion National Park in Utah. And uh, a couple here over here. Uh, we got Devil's Tower National Monument in Wyoming, Grand Tetons uh, in Wyoming, um, and uh, I've got Saguaro National Park and Carlsbad Caverns National Park in New Mexico. So a couple of those did you just go to for the first time? Yeah, so I went to five brand new parks in this uh, most recent iteration. Um, so the first, uh, the itinerary for the first trip was Badlands, um, went to Devil's Tower, we went to Yellowstone, Grand Teton, uh, drove down to Arches, Bryce Canyon, and then the Grand Canyon. And so that was about 4,000 miles. So we just did a big loop. Uh, the second time I taught the class, we stayed mostly in Utah. We went to Petrified Forest and the, the uh, uh, south rim of the Grand Canyon. Uh, and then we went to all five of the Utah parks, uh, Zion, Arches, Canyonlands, Bryce Canyon, um, and Capitol Reef. And then this most recent one, we went to the went southwest, went down to Carlsbad Caverns, which, by the way, was surprisingly awesome. I saw some pictures you posted. Yeah, it was super cool, man. I, was, I had low expectations. And then we, we camped in the Guadalupe Mountains. This is where I, I sprayed my feet with bear mace. Yeah. yeah, we've talked about bear spray on the podcast before, but we we're using it for analogy for believing in God. Yeah, well, um, you, pay, you spray it on your feet and, and it makes you uh, curse a little bit. Maybe say, take the Lord's name in vain. Yes. Uh, that's that's what I did. Isn't it, isn't it funny how many like, people, um, I wonder where it comes from that like when you like stub your toe or something, you're like, God damn it, or or like, it's or like, like the worst, Jesus, man, the, the worst oh thing, my God. The worst thing you can say, maybe that's it, it's a swear. Uh, I know, right? I'm not sure what the etymology is, but I'm a, a prolific swearer. Man, I worked in the car business for a couple, like not two tall years, but like a while. Like selling cars? Yeah, I learned how to smoke cigarettes and cuss. There you go. Yeah. But, it, but I didn't smoke cigarettes for very long, and then I started doing martial arts, and I was like, man leaving these cigarettes behind well done yeah well played owen would be really happy for you yes because owen's really concerned about why people smoke really my son yeah yeah 
yeah every time uh good for him yeah he's 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 you know but i also want to i you know have to let him know you people make their own choices and we can't judge them for those things so i know you know here's what's weird like um I'm like, uh, I'm like probably judgmental about people smoking cigarettes, but I'm like cigars, cool weed, no problems. Like, but cigarettes, I'm just like, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in a weird spot where I, uh, I, I don't, I don't think smoking is good. I think it's weird that it's one of these government sanctioned and subsidized drugs. that's socially acceptable. Uh, and but the, also yeah, and, like and more and more so, uh, as we go forward but it, it bothers me that if someone smokes they have to like hide underneath a you know they have to go hide to sm- smoke like i feel like we're infringing on people's freedoms to 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 you know destroy their own body but i feel like they should be allowed to do that if they want to i don't know I, it it's bothers me that designated smoking areas for employees and stuff like yeah. at walmart like out back behind the tire you have to you have to go and, you have to go and hide and there's like this public shaming that all of a sudden happens to people and i don't know i'm not a fan of that either you know yeah. like uh you know live and let live a little bit uh but uh but yeah so he's what, super what you, concerned so what do you know about nicotine uh it's very addictive uh, see i've heard like nicotine without all of the garbage is actually um possibly good for you I, like, i'm and, sure and that tra- there are things amounts. that are medicinal about it i don't know uh the way that we process it and and utilize it though with uh, whether it's uh, yeah. smoking or smokeless tobacco it's very harmful uh more so what is it the um uh, it's the drug that accounts for the most deaths in the United States is nicotine. Interesting. I would totally believe that. Yeah. We'll see, but I wonder if it's like how much, like, so like nicotine is like what I'm thinking is like a tobacco leaf produced from a tobacco leaf growing in a field yeah. in like the 1800s, not with like all the additives and car- like what they call carcinogens and all the trash and the poisons that are added to the nicotine. Yeah. Uh, there, yeah, there's some of that, but there's also, I mean, you know, it's a, the nicotine in and of itself is, uh, it's a chemical substance that, uh, your body can, can create a dependence upon. So, uh, it's apparently tough, tough to kick. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I've heard it's, um, more addictive than caffeine. I've, I've heard, i talk about people chewing nicotine gum mm-hmm. and it's just like, get some super jacked, like, like an Adderall or something, you know, yeah. like just really get you like, uh, but well, I, uh, I mean, I even gave up, I even gave up caffeine like over a year ago. Yeah. You so. told me about that, yeah. man. Good for you. I had a Coke two days ago. <laughs> I've been fantastic. craving a Coke recently Sorry. and no, it's okay. Um, but I got tired of the, the ups and the downs. Like I'd rather be just like, if I'm tired, I'd rather just be tired than, you know, be tired and then have a super lot of energy and then all of a sudden crash. Dude, drinking a bunch of coffees like that, man. Yeah. Like I noticed like sometimes, uh, like I, we were talking about, um, you were saying uh, like you tried meditating you, like before and you usually just fall asleep. I and I was like, uh, but then too, so like if I drink too much coffee and I'm just like, I'm tired, but like I haven't, like I'm not coming down off my coffee. I like, I'll lay down to try and sleep and I can't sleep. Yeah. So then I end up just thinking about stuff slash, but that's when I get to like, I usually get to a place where it's like, I don't sleep. I wouldn't, and, but I start thinking about stuff and eventually I'm just like laying there not thinking about anything. Well, it's a stimulant, right? So it's just, you know. It uh, it stimulates your entire body, probably including your mind. I don't know. This is not my area at all. So hey, we're just we can put a little bro science. We can bro science. I I mean, it seems like it. But yeah, call it academic freedom. I only have a master's degree, but you, sir. Yeah. So yeah, that's why I always tell every time I go in for a physical or whatever, uh, I always tell the guy, you know, I'm a doctor too. (laughs) Yes, you are. (laughs) I don't think they believe you. Should just be like, I'm just not practicing. That's right. Medicine. That's or I could say I'm, I'm a real doctor. My dad says that. He's like, that's why they call it practicing medicine. Like anytime a doctor pisses him off is yeah. what he says. Um, but yeah, the, uh, uh, the, whole, the whole idea of the trip came out of just wanting to do a big road trip. You know, so you so you did this road trip, but you've done another one. I've done it three times. Yeah, this is the oh, third wow. time. Did Usually, your family go with you every time. Every time, the family goes with me. So everybody likes it. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, know, we, for the most part. there are high points and low points. You know, there's uh, um, the, the car hostage situation. The car hostage <laughs> situation was one of the low points as my uh, my kids are becoming preteens, and you know they don't just 
do what I say all the time. Um, the you know low point on this trip was uh, on the second night that we're out in the Guadalupe Mountains. We'd spent all day um, hiking in to and out of uh, Carlsbad Caverns, which, by the way, if uh, if you're ever down in that part of Texas, and I don't know why anybody would be. Um, because it's a long way away and there's not much going on there. It's awesome. It's super cool. Um, but it's, you know, they have an, an elevator, but it's like a two to three hour wait to go down the elevator, uh, to go down the elevator and then get back up it. Um, but if you want to hike down it, it's, it's, uh, you're going to go down on switchbacks and the person, the, the ranger said it was the, the same distance as, as climbing all the stairs to get to the top of the empire state building. So how many stories is that? I think it's like, I have no idea. Isn't it like an, like eight, 900 feet? Yeah. Yeah. Which doesn't seem like a lot until you have to walk down it, carrying a four year old. And then, and then your quads start to jiggle a little bit. And then the hike out, Holly, uh, Holly's took Alice, my four year old and, and, uh, she and Hayden waited on the, um, waited on the uh the elevator and then we hiked out but so we've been doing that all day we got to guadalupe mountains which is about 45 minutes down the road on the texas side of the uh, new mexico texas border uh cool place never been there before got my tent set up my all my kids are in the tent and i have this uh, milk crate that i keep all my tools and stuff in for you know from car camping just so it's all together so i literally just got finished uh pounding in the last stake of our tent and uh this milk crate is sitting right you know by the opening of the tent and i tossed the mallet in there and it hit this uh this bear mace that i had and somehow on the trip uh, the safety had worked its way out. I don't know. It's a mystery. I'm not sure how it happened, uh, but it uh, it uh, it discharged and sprayed. I was about two feet from it. it sprayed uh, most of the contents all over my feet. I had a pair of Chaco sandals on. And did it go? Uh, it was just in the tent. It was outside of the tent. That's good. Did and you get to sleep in the tent? Uh, not that night. Uh, that was the beginning of uh, a long night. Um, sprayed all over my feet, and I didn't really know what had happened. And then my feet started burning, and then my kids that were in the tent uh, started screaming because they were getting the they were getting the fumes, and uh, hollered at my older kid, my kids, to hold their breath. Uh, the older kids did that, got out of the tent, um, but Alice didn't know to hold her breath, and so she was breathing it in for probably a minute before one of the students went in and grabbed her. And uh, I couldn't grab them because I literally I had it all over my hands, all over my feet. Um, it was all over my pants, up to my kind of right below my knees. And um, so, yeah, they were like, uh, my kids were dry heaving and coughing. Alice was saying that her insides were burning. Um I, uh, I got my got my uh, pants ripped off. I took my pants off in front of you know everybody, uh, just because they were saturated whoa, whoa. with bear spray, and uh, rinsed off my feet like you're supposed to. Um, kind of with like water by a creek or no? Something? They had they had uh, they had uh, it was a campground, so they had some they had some potable water that we were going to use for cooking, and um, couldn't get. I didn't have any cell service, so I couldn't get in touch with poison control. And so we went to talk to the ranger, and the ranger was like, I think you guys should just go get checked out. So uh, told us to go to Carlsbad, New Mexico, which was 55 uh, miles away, to go to the emergency room. And so got in the van and took off, uh, drove about 90 or 100 miles per hour, made the drive in about 30 minutes, um, got to the emergency room. By that time, all the kids were fine, but my feet were on fire. Um Ended up, uh, everybody's pulse ox was fine. Everybody was fine. Uh, but I had chemical burns on my feet. And uh, so they, they treated me for the chemical burns. Um, told me that I might be painful to wear shoes for the next couple of days. So I had to wear flip-flops for a couple of days until it stopped. And um, yeah, not a great way to start the trip, but. Did you file your incident report? I filed my incident report. Damn, that's two in one trip. Now there's only one in one trip. Oh yeah, so okay, yeah. No, so, there was no other incident. So you did. So, so the bear spray was 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 that incident report? That filable? was an incident report. Yeah. What about the what about the hailstorm? Hailstorm was not. Um, so okay, this yeah, was. Uh, so we uh, from Guadalupe Mountains. We'll do the we'll do the whole trip. We drove uh, across uh, Texas, um, Western Texas. Not much going on in Western Texas. Um, went through a couple of uh, mandatory uh, traffic stops that were on our side of the border. Um, that was really interesting. They were uh, they had uh, 
there was a two lane highway and they took uh, one lane of the highway had it coned off and then uh, had a like a temporary structure on the other one and everybody had to drive in and they took a look in your car and they Why? what for i don't know they were they were border patrol but we were a good 30 or 40 miles on the american side of the border so um i thought that was really interesting we had to do that uh outside of el paso and then had to do that outside of las cruces new mexico that's crazy man i know in the united states of america we have to do mandatory did you hear about trump sending the national guard i did hear about that that's unfortunate yeah um feel like maybe there's better things we could give our resources to at this point uh like protecting our national parks um uh, so then we drove to Tucson, Arizona, and outside of Tucson was Saguaro, uh, the place where there are these uh, giant uh, 30, 40 feet cacti. There's cactus everywhere. It's awesome. Um, from there, we drove up to the uh, south rim of the Grand Canyon, stayed in a, stayed in a, a lodge out there, got to go do some uh, uh, stargazing at the Grand Canyon, which was super cool. Saw the sun set and the sunrise at the Grand Canyon. And then we drove up to uh, Zion, uh, where we camped for two nights. I uh, did some hiking up there and then drove to, uh, on our way to Arches, we stopped at uh, Bryce Canyon. And then at Arches, uh, we got there and uh, I made the decision not to let everybody camp uh, because there were thunderstorms in the area. And I was worried about, uh, you know, when you're camping in the desert, you can't stake down your tent. Yeah. Because of the sand. Um, so if there were high winds, which were supposed to be, so we ended up getting a hotel. I went and ate at a really nice brewery there in Moab, uh, the Moab brewery. Go. And, uh, the next morning we got up early, uh, headed out to go to hike the delicate arch. So the delicate arch is the one you see in all the pictures, uh, s- super, uh, charismatic kind of feature. Um, it's about a, it's about a, a three mile round trip hike. And we got about a mile and a half into the hike. Um, and uh, the thunderstorm that was north, that was supposed to go north, it, it, it shifted directions. And uh, we got into a big wash uh, and uh, started hearing the thunder. And I got the group together and I said we needed to turn back. And within a minute, it was uh, the sky opened up and it was hailing, you know. Yeah. That's where you guys were at. That's where we were headed to. Yeah. And so to get to that, you got to hike up the slick rock. Um, started oh, hailing on us, uh, thunder, lightning, heavy rain. We couldn't see hardly anything. And so while it was raining really hard and was hailing, we hunkered down like under a sage bush. Um, and then as soon as the hail stopped and the rain lightened up and it was safe enough, we started to descend. And while we're hiking back down the trail, there's lightning flashing on both sides of us. It was probably the, the most danger that I've ever been in uh hiking because of the the lightning uh you know you're in the desert there aren't any trees uh you are the lightning rod so um you ever know anyone that was struck by lightning i didn't know anybody that was struck by lightning but it's it's dangerous to uh to be uh exposed in lightning um we were lucky apparently a lot of people survive that they do i don't want to experience it i mean especially not after spraying my feet with bear mace I'd have to do a big incident report on that. Yeah. And then so there are there are situations where there are people that are that are hiking together and one of them gets struck by lightning and it travels bounces to the other one to the other people. Yeah, I um just recently I was listening to some someone talking about lightning and seen it. They were talking about balls of lightning. Mm-hmm. Uh, I never really thought about that or knew much about it, but I I was looking it up. Apparently that, like what you're saying, how it bounces, like it can, a ball of lightning can form and and go from one object to another. Typically, a lot of times it happens like they're talking about it happening on an airplane. So, Well, I mean, the electricity will travel to wherever you can, you know, you have a conductor. And so all of us were soaking wet and, uh, you know, I had my three older kids with me. I was really happy. I didn't have the four-year-old on my back. Um, but that would have been, that would have been crazy. She just, she stayed down. She stayed with my wife. They stayed at the hotel, um, cause it was early and, you know, we didn't want to do it, but, uh, that was exciting and exhilarating. Um, and as we're hiking back down, there were places that were just trickling with water that were swollen. And so flash floods were coming and it was, uh, it was uh, a little bit after that, they actually closed the trail and, um, but uh, that was pretty crazy. Uh, we got back to uh, we got back in time to kind of change in our hotels and drove uh, into Colorado to Mesa Verde uh, to the uh, the Pueblo um, cliff dwellings. 
which was that was cool. super cool as well. And then on our way out, uh, we were we stopped off at uh, Great Sand Dunes in Colorado, and then drove to Dodge City, Kansas, and then home. It's a big trip. How eight days was it? We ten were days? ten days. Wow! How many students you take with you? I took ten students with me, uh, my family, and then another faculty member, a biology professor. Without violating any Title IX, can you say any funny stories about any of the students, any of them? You know, this group was, they were really awesome. Um, there was no drama, which is different than any other group that I've had. There had been so many drama. I mean, I, in the first trip that I had, I had a, a student, we were in Yellowstone, and a uh, person got pissed off and called me a son of a bitch in front of my family. So One of your was, students? Yes. Yeah, that was really interesting. On that same trip, I had a, I had an incident where a student had been hiking around in the desert all day, and uh, in Bryce Canyon, and uh, got back to the campsite, and he um, had this uh, rash on his feet and up his legs, and then uh, I treated him with some uh, uh, some Benadryl. Just gave him some Benadryl. Uh, by ten o'clock that night, the rash had spread all the way up his legs, up his body, and was on his neck and on his face and so i had to i had to extract him out i had uh, at that point in time on that trip i had some uh, injectable epinephrine that uh i had primed and ready to go if his uh, throat started clearing up so we had to drive 45 minutes to an emergency room so they could give him some incident report incident report with that one um so we had to do that one um yeah, I mean, you know, it's a great time for... That's why, I mean, any time you take a group of people out like that, yeah. stuff like that's going to happen. It does happen. You can't control everything. You kind of try to make the best plans and react as well. I mean, I have uh, I've literally hundreds of hours out in the woods with people. Um, I'm a trained wilderness first responder uh, with certifications in wilderness medicine. Um, so, you know, I have I have as much training as, you know would qualify me to be able to do this and i you know you can always get more and i'd like to have more um what's well, cool that um you get to do this is kind of a so you know what is your part of part of your work part of your profession part of what you're doing your ac- academics and like continue what continue education what are they what are they what do you would you call that uh this is it's a, basically it's uh it's professional development right yeah. so yeah, there you it, go. it allows me kind of uh, at this point in my career you know i'm i'm already i'm tenured um, I've already been promoted to a full professor, so I don't really have anywhere else to like achieve with that. Um, I did that in uh, in 12 years, so you kind of get to that top, and then you should try to figure out what you want to do next. And so I think the next phase of my uh, professional life is going to be all about experiential education. Cool. And uh, going out and getting your hands dirty and experiencing the things firsthand that you're studying. Uh, I also teach a class on the Buffalo and the White River where we spend a lot of time uh, in those places. Um, next semester, I'm developing a class, a project-based uh, sustainability class. We're going to start by uh, kind of studying the concept of sustainability and then taking that concept and applying it on an individual and then a small group and a class level. Uh, but I think that's, you know, that's stuff that I like to do, and I think that's stuff that can make an impact. I mean, I've had, I've had a number of students go on and work for the Park Service. Uh, one of the students who is now, uh, she's a park ranger with the uh, the Buffalo National River up in, um, up in Ponca, and cool. uh, she, you know, got her first job working for Arches National Park. Uh, the summer after she graduated, and she took the class, and one of the the parks that we studied was Arches, and so. You know, I think it has the the ability to impact people directly, and uh, you can't always see that in, in education. Yeah, you know that is that is interesting because I remember um, struggling for a long time, which I do a lot of different things, and that was kind of, I guess, always my my plan. So I so I got the uh, I've got the history gig rolling, and I've got the gym, obviously, and then the podcast. It's my three top things I do. You got a lot on your plate. Yeah, but um, it's uh, like I remember when I first started training martial arts, I was like, I could do this. I could, I could provide this experience for people. You know, mm-hmm. like I was like, because I was watching like my coaches, and I was like, yeah, okay, yeah, I see what you're doing. Yeah, I could do that. Yeah, and I always felt that way about lecturing too. I was ta- uh, talking to somebody on the podcast the other day about like a long time ago, just being like, oh man, I can't wait until. I get to lecture 
and now that I do it, like I am like super excited about it. Love hearing myself talk apparently. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, it's, um, it is, it is rewarding because like, I learned all this stuff and I'm, I'm trying to like, get, I don't know, share it with other people and see if they get interested in it. Sometimes they do. Yeah. You know, I think the, the best way, uh, at least I've found is, uh, is, um, getting people doing the thing that you're teaching them. Like going hands on. With hands it. on. I mean, that's exactly what you do with, with the martial arts, whether you're teaching jujitsu or you're teaching kickboxing. It is very multifaceted in how you're learning. Yeah. And I think, I think that's what, um, you know, that's what I was really hoping to create with this class. And I'm, I'm really proud of this class because I think it is, uh, you know, just besides going and seeing some really awesome places and taking my family to see some awesome places. Do you get grants and stuff for this? No, the, the students pay a fee. Uh, it's like a study abroad class, but the, um, oh, well, yeah, but I mean, we did, so we did the entire 10 days and the fee for the students was $850 and that was all inclusive. That was everything that was, so kind of budget hotel stays too. Yeah. I mean, we, we were, we had it set up half and half. So half nights, uh, hotel, half nights and camping, uh, that was all the food on the road. That was all lodging. That was transportation. We rented vans. Um, that was everything. Wow. Uh, we even got T-shirts. So nice. Yeah. Uh, and so I've, I'm, I'm, I'm pr- I kind of have it down to where I know what my budget is. Um, as long as unforeseen things don't pop up, um, I can stay within that. Yeah. But uh, it's. I mean, you couldn't uh, by yourself. You couldn't do a trip like that for ten days. So see those places and do those things for that amount of money. Yeah, no, I mean, and uh, I, I tell people this all the time. Um, experiences cost money. Mm-hmm. And experiences also change your entire, like, way you look at things sometimes. Uh, like, I paid a couple hundred bucks for certain experiences or a couple of thousand, mm-hmm. and they've, like, been super impactful on me. Yeah, you know, you... Uh one of the the students were talking about it because I gave him. We got back from the the class and I gave him the week off after that. And so we were debriefing, and uh, one of the students was talking about the fact that you know you can look at pictures of the Grand Canyon, or you can look at pictures of the the you know uh, peaks at uh, the Rocky Mountains. You can look at it, pictures are one thing, but when you see it yourself, right? When you drive uh, out of the plains into the mountains, or when you drive out of the mountains into the desert, or you standing at the precipice of this uh, giant hole in the earth that was uh, created uh, by erosion uh, over millions of years. And at some points you can't even see the other end. And it is literally a hole from horizon to horizon in the earth that you can't even see the bottom to, um, you know, that is a spiritual experience. That's a put you in your place, let you know how tiny and insignificant you're 80 to 90 years on this planet, you know, um, I think those are the those are the moments that I'm hoping uh, to be one twelve. Yeah, one twelve. Have you done the uh, live to a hundred dot com survey? I have not. So there's there's a pretty comprehensive survey. According to that, I'm 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 ninety. I'm going to go to ninety six, which is okay. I'd like to go to one hundred, but you know I'm not going to really quibble over four years. At one twelve, I'm still like a really good percentage left of life right now. Yeah, is that? <laughs> 112 is just a good, you think that's a good it's number a good for number. Yeah. Okay. You'd be really old at 112. I know, man. I feel older than I am right now. Yeah. I'm a little, I'm a little, uh, not puny, but, um, I've been having this kind of cough. I'm sure my voice might sound weird to the listeners. Maybe you too. But, uh, I feel like, uh, <clears throat> I noticed that yesterday I was out. Um, I took some day quote right before you got here. It's like, go, 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 go. Mm-hmm. so at least it wasn't the green NyQuil though. That's yeah, something to knock you dude. out. Dude. Yeah, it will. Man, uh, you know, did you get the flu this year? I did. Oh, oh. man, it was, I guess when you came on the podcast at last, because you were my first guest, I just had the flu. Yeah, and, and I had just had the flu, and that was actually, I had just gotten over the flu, and then I was developing my sinus infection. That's what, that may be what this is. I kind of, uh, it's not, I think it's allergies. Yeah. I like, cause, uh, like this weird, the weather's doing all this weird stuff. And like, I noticed that. Um, I mean, like yesterday it snowed. Yeah. What the hell? <laughs> you know, yes. it's, it's a really good thing that the, the, the whole climate change is a bunch of crap. Yeah. Cause if it wasn't, then, you know, we might be in trouble. Yeah. It did snow yesterday and it's April, what, 7th yesterday. Uh-huh. In Arkansas, by the way. It has, it has snowed in April in Arkansas before, but very few and far between. It's been in the last, actually, probably 10 years 
or less. I'm sure that, that I'm sure that we have nothing to do with that as people on this planet. I'm going to say we probably do, Jesse. Yeah, maybe. I'm not s- taking sides here. My sarcasm didn't come across. What do perhaps? you know about um the uh, the SpaceX rocket punching a hole in the atmosphere that was like a super, you know? I don't know, but I watched that. I, I watched it on the uh, on the internet. The SpaceX rocket. You talking about the one that launched the car out in the space not too long I ago? I mean, I'm not getting into the car because I just told someone earlier I didn't believe that part. But you don't believe but, that. But part? the rocket's going into space. Um, I well, you know, yeah. Uh, I don't. I, man, I'm just like, is that car really floating in space right now? Probably. Did you see? Did you see any of the footage of it? The most impressive thing that was a part of that was that the boosters that got it out of the atmosphere. Did you see this part when it came back down? Came back oh down. my gosh! Yeah. That was what like, is that called? Like that reverse propulsion sort of freaking like, science fiction. <laughs> man, you know what I want? So I want to know when am I getting my flying car? That's what I want to know. Well, see, so Elon Musk will not be the provider of the flying car. He says it's too stressful. He says he's trying to engineer ways that make society less stressful, like shipping people to Mars or putting tunnels under Los Angeles. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, the, uh, I've read a lot about the whole flying car phenomenon because if you watch any science fiction, the, the common denominators that we're going to, you know, we're going to fly around in cars. Dude, I want to be the rocketeer. With it on your back? Yeah. I remember that movie. Yeah. We just like, we were watching this Fort Bragg thing, uh, training video that I cited in my thesis and the rocketeer was there, dude, 1961. Yeah, I feel like we might be past that technology. Maybe. I don't know. But the thing about flying is that you have to be able to fly it. Right? Dude, do you ever have like uh, reoccurring dreams of flying? I do not. I do. I always have. Yeah. It's weird. I was just thinking that the other day, how that's like a reoccurring. Like sometimes um, it's not like, you know, like I have wings and I'm flying through the air, but uh, like like flying just different. I don't like flying. I don't really either, man. I mean, I've been in an airplane. It, it kind of, um, kind of stresses me out. Yeah. I don't, I don't like flying at all. Uh, I'm not a big fan of it. I flew to Orlando this summer. Um, still didn't like it. I hadn't I'm flown for like 12 here, years. Uh, I don't know how long, whenever choruses were going Disney place, universal studios. Have fun with that. I don't know if it's Disney world or Disneyland. I can't it's remember because I don't care. But, um, I think that, uh, she's not going to listen to this. She only listens to the podcast that she comes on. <laughs> But, um, I know, like I do so many podcasts. I'm like, I can get away with this. What's the likelihood she's going to listen to it? She'll probably listen to it then. Yeah, I know. That's Maybe funny. Maybe she'll, because I don't know. <laughs> well, I do tell her uh, periodically, like, oh, we talked about you on the podcast today. I'm sure she's like, still doesn't listen though, but maybe she does. Maybe. But that's, you know, the whole not liking to fly is part of the reason why this, you know, I like road trips. Right on. You know, because most of these places that are so awesome are, uh, uh, you need to just fly over them. You don't get the kind of the same experience, right? Like the the whole, the journey is the whole point, right? The fact that, yeah, if you're going to get to Colorado, you have to drive through Kansas, Ugh. right? If you're going to get to Yellowstone, you're going to have to drive across Wyoming. And if I, you're driving through Kansas is a major low point. <laughs> I thought that that was the major low point until I drove through West Texas. Yeah, like where, like where, whereabouts in West, West Texas? So we drove, uh, our first drive, first day was from Clarksville, Arkansas to Lubbock, Texas. So we drove all the way over to Amarillo, Texas, and then See, south. Amarillo, it starts to get weird. So then we... Wind. Yeah, well, you know, the drive from Amarillo to Lubbock, and then from Lubbock down into, uh, you know, by Carlsbad, but in that the western part where they have all of the the different oil fields uh where the environment is basically just dead uh was insane it was like everything you see in a western movie where there's just nothing and there's tumbleweed blowing around there's nothing to look at it's crazy i told my class this story the other day last time i drove to vegas I got to the other side of Amarillo and this crazy storm blew up and like it like turned this like orange color outside, like this really crazy color, crazy winds, and then a big tumbleweed blew across in front of me and then a semi truck blew over. Wow. Yeah. That's the kind of stuff that happens. But my my perspective on it is that if that drive through West Texas wouldn't have sucked so bad, then perhaps the drive from the southern part all the way to the northern part of Arizona wouldn't have been so awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For perspective, you know? 
It is. It is interesting how it contrasts once you get out of out of that part of Texas. Have you driven? I mean, Arizona from you know Tucson pretty much all the way up to Flagstaff. That's an amazing drive. It's an amazing drive. And then when you drive up through into uh, into the southern part of Utah, it's incredible. The, the way that the landscape Utah. changes is insane. I mean, you go from uh, first of all the different colors that you're going to see. I mean, it's if you were if you were a geologist. You know, you're basically going up the grand staircase. Aren't you? Uh, don't you have family in Utah? Uh, I do have family in Utah. We didn't get to see any of those family in Utah. I lived in Utah for four years, so I, I have this love for Utah. And is, is that where Holly's from too? Or? Her family is from there. She's not from there. We met at Utah State University in Logan, my wife and I. Um, so we have a, a soft spot for for Utah. Um, Utah is an amazing state, uh, kind of. Some cultural challenges, but the the landscapes are incredible. We were talking about. Um, I had a professor on the podcast, Aaron MacArthur. I don't know if you know him. I but, don't. Uh, he uh, so it's a good listen. We were talking about the Mountain Meadows Massacre a little bit. Yeah, is that the the one where uh, the wagon train from Arkansas? That is correct. So that one's really interesting uh, because. Well, see, he is he he is a uh, a Mormon, um, and he's. Uh, I don't know what position we didn't really go into like, but he's, he's plugged in with the church, you know, like he, like his written, he's a historian. He's done, we've done work for the church. Um, and, uh, that's kind of what doomed the, the, the Mormons, uh, in that whole situation of that massacre was because they keep such good genealogical records. Yeah. Right. And so they had these anomalies, these like uh, these children of the the Arkansans who were supposedly murdered by the the, the Indians. Right. But uh, but they were showing up in you know Mormon households. How'd that happen? Well, it happened that they were wasn't really the Indians at all. Yeah. But it depends. So you know there's still uh, there's still if you go to Utah, they still they still tell the story of the. That it was actually Mormons that that rescued the children from the Indians. See, uh, well, I, he didn't say that, but what we did get into is that um, he did um, go into the the whole thing with the Piutes a little bit, and that they kind of were blamed for it. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, he was—I uh, mean, he wasn't. He wasn't trying to ma manipulate any history. I was actually, I was like, wow, that really stacks up exactly with uh, the perspective I got in Arkansas history. Yeah. So, well, it's been, I, guess I think it's, it's been pretty consistent recently, but early on it was very different versions of history. Yeah. Did you, um, did you watch that show on Netflix, Godless? They you went know, into that. I started watching it. I just didn't really get, get into, into it. It. Um, it took me like the, by the third episode, I was pretty hooked. It takes some character development and. But it's it's an interesting show. I like westerns, but uh, I haven't really I haven't really had time to to watch a lot of stuff. Summertime and Christmas breaks is when we kind of do that stuff. Um, when is know, uh, Man in the High Castle season three coming out? I have no idea. I don't know. Like I said, I'm not plugged in. Yeah, I've been watching for that. Um, then I also recently watched Goliath, Billy Bob. Speaking of Arkansas, there we go. Another Arkansas actor. Um, Arkansas wagon trains, Arkansas actors, but uh, that was a really good one. Check that one that. out. Is it's, that it's a, the, uh, the attorney of the law drama thing like that? Yeah, and it's only I think it's only eight episodes. It might be ten, but uh, really good, dude. I was like, what? And uh, I heard a stat about it. It's kind of was like, well, maybe I should watch it, but it had like the highest rate of like people like so like one of my podcasts. Like if you look at like the most popular views on any of the platforms. It, it'll calculate like most views or listens, but it also is like factors in how long someone listens. Yeah. So you might have a podcast with 300 listens, but, um, they might've listened for, uh, like a shorter average time than one with like 250 listens. So the one with 250 listens has more minutes of listen time. So right. I put that ahead. So it's, you know, people tur turn it off or whatever, but, yeah i've been getting i've been trying to start breaking down my analytics i'm on so many different they like i submitted to three audio sites and now i'm on 10 nice i'm like dude you're growing bud and i and to think that it all started here with me in the first episode, the dude, first episode which is actually like the seventh most popular i was just looking today well it's it's the oldest so vintage yeah it's a vintage podcast i gotta do something about this mic stand shaking 
I'm, I'm not growing pains. It's okay. Yeah, it uh, that is a cool. Is this a cool little? I would kind of like to get mic stands like this for the uh, for everybody. Well, the radio uh, the radio station at uh, Ozarks has them, and then they come down and like are right here. Yeah, and then they've got the um, they've got the mics on them, but they also have the the uh, like these round. Uh, pop filters. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, see, like I, one of these, like I just went with the uh, the foam cover there because uh, that is an omnidirectional. So I could do like you can do four different patterns. You can do everybody. You can do me and you across from each other. Mm-hmm. We could do a T pattern. So if there's somebody sitting right there and not pick up over here, or just solo. Technology, man. I've been fiddling around because on this trip, I, I did a bunch of uh, recording. I'm trying to do a, a documentary on the trip. And uh, so I've been kind of tinkering around on iMovie uh, with all the kind of capabilities. And so I'm getting ready to. to Dude, kinda, you're more than welcome to borrow that mic if, because uh, you could just take it home because I'm not using it right now because I actually bought the wrong damn microphone. Yeah. Like I thought that had a. F- okay, so there's two models. And I, I thought I was getting, I thought, I, I don't know, I thought for some reason that all of those had a five pin XLR cable. So I even bought the supporting cable I needed to be able to run that like into this recorder, into the mixer. Like I'd set up like this whole thing to where I was going to, but it's still, it's still super beneficial. What I'm going to use it for is when I start recording lectures for like online classes, but it's a USB mic. Yeah. Plug it straight. I mean, it's the same mic. Joe Rogan uses the same mic. Well, and if it's good enough for Joe Rogan. Yeah. For, for portable stuff, man, you can't beat it. Well, I was kind of, I was surprised at the, the quality of uh, uh, gear that I could get for a uh, low amount. I mean, I, I filmed it all on my, my iPhone. And then uh, I've gone through, and then I airdropped everything onto my iPad. Dude, my iPhone is like has a, almost as big of a hard drive as this computer right here. Like, <laughs> the only thing is, is that uh, what I've noticed is that uh, uh, I have to use my computer to to do um, like the title sequence, and because I can't do that on the uh, I can't do that on the iPad. It doesn't have all of the options. Yeah, it is a lot more stripped down because I use iMovie a lot too. Yeah, for now. Um, and that's, you know, when I get to, uh, once I get all the, I've got to do the follow-up interviews with all the students and then kind of edit it all together. And then I'll, uh, kind of write the script and do the voiceover and sick, man. Yeah. And then I have a buddy of mine, uh, you know, uh, do you know Neil Harrington? Our, yeah. Our yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Neil's going to do like a, uh, like he's got a steel guitar. He's going to do a acoustic steel guitar soundtrack for me. Cool. So, um, we'll see how it all turns out. Yeah, uh, how do you know Neil? His wife is a professor at uh, U of O. Okay, and so I know Neil real well. We uh, we hang out a lot. Our kids, you know, we are we had kids. The same ask age. him, ask him if he remembers me. He, he does. He remembers okay. you. Yeah, yeah. Tell him I said hello. I will do that. I will definitely do that. He, uh, um, yeah, he's a good dude. Yeah, back when I, I wouldn't, I didn't teach kids. I convinced him to get his kid into karate. Sorry, Neil. <laughs> didn't work out for him uh well i don't know but i just know that like it's not the same as what i offer <laughs> which is actually why i stopped uh splitting right with those people because uh they didn't want me to start kids classes and now i have more kids in my gym than they have in their entire gym without getting into fitness or adults or anything yeah you guys have a lot going on at your gym and uh yeah it's growing all the time we're gonna have to upgrade our stuff you guys are gonna have to. Uh, you guys are gonna have to figure out a way to uh, start to um, farming out some of the work, so you guys can have more free time. Yeah, yeah, that is. Which I am doing that. Cora, Cora needs like to relinquish some control. Like, um, you know, I, I don't know. For me, it was always like. I could never be uh, like a. I could never just like get like it's like no. This is mine. Mm-hmm. I will never l- relinquish control, which is kind of a like a younger person's way of thinking about it. And I'm not saying I'm older and wiser or anything, but like the older I got, I was more able to just be like, no, hey, I'll share this with you. Mm-hmm. I didn't like sharing my toys when I was a kid either, dude, you know? But uh, that, but like Cora is just like with her, she can accept like, uh, it was never this for me. It was different reasons, but she can't accept like, I will do a better job. Yeah. And because I do such a good job, no one else can 
it was never it was never that for me it was just like it was almost like uh just trusting people to i don't know it was it was not it was not about like it, it, we have sort of different reasons for life but i have a lot of people that help me teach classes right now and i really enjoy it yeah you know the the first time i did this class uh i went i was the only faculty supervisor right i was the only chaperone and so it was all on me and so the second time i did it i, I brought someone along with me and it was so nice to share that responsibility yeah. and um i won't ever do it again any boyfriends and girlfriends on the trip not that I know of, you know, wasn't, uh, was never any of that kind of drama. Um, no, I mean, uh, you know, just me and my wife, but yeah, other than the that, ultimate boyfriend and girlfriend, there you go. Um, no, no, I don't think so. I mean, there, I don't know if there were hookups between students. I don't need to know that. I don't want to know that. That's not in the report. That's not in the report. Uh, it didn't come up. It's not, I'm not going to ask about it. I can it. just only imagine student drama because dude at the gym, like just the other day we had, his kids class I don't know maybe you were one of the parents that called the cops on the other parents who were arguing out in the parking lot dude I went home to feed the dog and let him outside to go pee and was gone literally 25 minutes and I got here and my buddy Dylan who helps teach one of the kids classes messaged me and he was like bro popo at the gym you know and I was like sends me a picture of two cop cars out in the lot and I'm just like yeah yeah parents oh yes um that's going to be dealt with this week. Cool. It was not me. Yeah, in a variety of ways. Because, like, dude, it just keeps getting worse. Because first I heard that, like, it was a domestic issue. And I heard that this dad called on the mom. And then I heard that then it was another member that called the kid. I was just like, jeez. No, I, that, that I didn't know anything about that. Um, yeah. And it wasn't me in the parking lot either. Because, as you know, I, I'm, not allo- I'm not allowed to fight anymore. So, Yes, my very my very brief fighting career. What was, what was the quote? I don't uh, remember. It's, it's, we won't it's go not into like it. uh, it's not like you use your brain to make a living. Yes, that too. Yeah, um, and now the, now the, we're all suffering. Yes, yes, yes. That was it. That was it. Oh man, <laughs> that's okay. You know what? Forty one is probably a little old to start in the fight game. You know. You know, if you were fifty one, I'd be like, "This is a crisis. You're here for." for <laughs> But 41, I don't, I don't know, man. It's not a crisis. I noticed my dad, like, when he got into, like, being 50, 53, that's when he really started being like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to get more big toys or like, he's got like this orange Harley Davidson now, like a sportster with chrome pipes. And I'm just like, dude, what are you doing over here, man? You said you were going to get that for like a few months and sell it for a profit and you've had it for three years. Yeah. Or something like that. It's fun. No, no. You know what? I, you know what? I may, I may not, I may not belt test again. I'm just kind of in it to do it, and like, I do like it, it and I dig it, and I like knowing the stuff. I like the, the way my body feels doing it. Um, as long as I don't hurt myself, dude. I love the. Uh, for me, it's always been like uh, the patterns of like information. Mm-hmm. You know, like uh, somebody the other day, I was trying to explain to them. They were telling me that they had gone through uh, something similar, like just like something to change the way they thought and viewed. Um, was it, were they, they they were talking about starting training jujitsu, and I was like, yeah, that too. But uh, when I took the class logic, I was like, that like repatterned the way I think about things. Like I, the way I, I like made I started making lists after that, dude. Yeah, and now it's uh, everything is just like organize information organize information organize information which is is good but that's also like what i always observed about like martial arts when i was when i'm always learning but just like like pulling the same pieces like oh that's like this and putting them together you know Mm -hmm. like uh the other day i taught a private the guy and he's like man i was i was wanting to work on this certain type of choke and uh, it's kind of it's not an obscure choke but most people don't know a whole lot of different ways to do it. And I showed him three different ways to do it that he'd never seen before. And it's just like that, like it took me 10 years to come up with those three different ways to do it, you know, that are kind of, and I know a lot of other ways to do this choke, but, uh, there's sort of different entries and a couple of them I picked up within the last couple of years. And it's like, still they're fundamental. They're, they're good for everybody, but he was, uh, he was digging them. But, uh, Anyway, man, um, yeah. Well, so are you going to do, 
a similar project with the Buffalo River? Were you saying that? No, I teach a class on uh, the. Are Buff- you going to do a documentary on the Buffalo? No, I don't. I mean, it just depends on how this goes. It may, I'm, you know, if I if I like this stuff and it works out and it doesn't suck. I, what I have to do is I have to stop watching uh, nature documentaries that have really expensive, awesome cameras and, you know, crews and whatnot, because it makes me feel really inadequate uh, when I compare my own. But uh, no, I just mostly want to document it. And uh, what I'm really interested in, what I'm really excited to do is uh, uh, the follow up interviews, because I did uh, pre interviews with all the students. You know, what were their expectations? What are they excited about? And then to, to see what. Um, you know what their thoughts are when they've done the trip and they're back for it and their perspective. So I'm excited to to kind of I think that's where a lot of the meat's going to come from. How much you how much editing have you done? Like uh, just before this project, for example. Uh, I mean, we did. Uh, so the uh, U of O every year has uh, something called a 48 hour movie project, um, where you uh, you go in and you have basically two days and a weekend to film like a six to seven minute movie. Um, so we did one of those. My family competed in it one year, and that's about it. Uh, did you was, win? Uh, we did not. We did not win. Uh, but my kids, uh, my kids wrote the entire thing. This is kind of a weird. It has like slack in it. A little bit. It's fine. But you can. But I can also I can lean yeah. into it. Uh, but it was called the Kung Fu Kids Strike Back, and so uh, we filmed it, and uh, that was it. That was the only experience I ever had uh, besides just. Um, Man, just like little things, like I'm thinking all your students like tapping their name into the title box. Mm-hmm. That's the shit that wears me out. Yeah, it's a lot of... I don't do that for the podcast. There's a lot of tedium that goes into it, but that's going to be after the fact when I'm going in. And uh, right now I'm just going through all the, the footage that I have and kind of trying to figure out little clips of that footage and where I want to do it. I have, a, I have a title sequence worked out, like a three-minute title sequence. Um, nice. and, uh, and I kind of not have done that one chronologically with... Uh, edited in pictures of each one of the parks, uh, each one of the the signs for the parks. You use the Ken Burns effect. I did use the Ken Burns. Yeah, effect. did you like how it's a stock feature on our movie? It was cool. It was a cool stock feature. So I used that effect, and then I also I put the uh, the title sequence all in in uh, sepia, so like it's that that kind of very tonal thing. Um, and I started off with a quote, you know, um, uh, yeah, what is it? Any day is a good day in the woods, or something like that. Um, I can't remember what the quote is. It's Nicholas. No, Nicholas Sparks. No, it's Alex Nicholson is the guy that the, the quotes by. But um, beyond that, I'm just kind of trying to get it organized. And yeah, no, that's um, that's awesome, dude. Cool project. I'm all about it. I think you should start your own YouTube channel and do documentaries and just retire. I put together. I put together. We did a trip to uh, not too long ago to, out to um, the Natural Bridge at uh, Alum Cove. Have you ever been out there by deer? Uh, it's a nice little hike. It's got a, a natural bridge that that goes over, uh, kind of goes over this. I think of, I think I know where you're talking about though. So it's right after you leave Deer before you get to Highway Seven. Mm-hmm. And uh, I did a little like uh, six minute video on the uh, no, set up. Do you have a YouTube channel set up? For uh, there is projects? one. I can't remember what it's called. Um, I set one up so that I could uh, uh, link it to Facebook and put it on there. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll figure out something. I, you know, I have no idea what I'm going to do with the video once I get it done. So, yeah, I made a documentary in uh, college, uh, and I need to. I was just talking. I was just trying to get it from tech recently, um, trying to get it located. And uh, it's crazy. All the projects I was a part of, even the K through 12 initiative and stuff, have gone on to total other people and other departments, even. Yeah. Well, that, so, that stuff is belong that belongs to the university, so that's not yours. Yes, here's uh, here's a funny story, uh, which I'm not saying I wanted any credit for it, but <clears throat> I filmed and produced like 152 DVDs that went out to high schools while I was uh, in grad school, and uh, it, the uh, there was a professor that had donated a bunch of money to the foundation and kind of was like my boss on the project. But, uh, and they did like essentially what I'm doing right now in terms of, um, Hey Jesse, you want to come on the podcast? You know, Mm -hmm. uh, that, and, uh, you know, a graduation, how they list like, uh, uh, accomplishments, 
like in the in the program, like everything you've done that year or whatever, they put like all 152 titles in there of like that she had produced all these DVDs and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, okay, that's how the world works. That's how the world works, man. Yeah. But it, it was, I just thought it was humorous because it's like literally no effort by that person went into it other than just like bankrolling overseeing it and you get to do the work for their uh, that's the way it is for publications too when you're in graduate school and if you're and if you're uh if you're lucky you'll get like a third or fourth authorship well i got uh i got a couple of shout outs and uh some different projects and uh, i know core got an encyclopedia ar- article published and stuff but uh, she got credit for it you know mm-hmm. uh that was my thing is like put 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 an asterisk uh with my name in there somewhere if you want it to be totally fair and not be uh i don't know I, I didn't need that, but I, I just I thought it was dishonest mm-hmm. because uh, if if there would have been any intellectual work done on the part of that professor whatsoever, I would have been like, oh no, it's totally you should do that. But every other professor in the department that knew that that was a project that I was on came and said something to me about it and was like, "Did you see that, Brian?" I was yep. like, "Yeah." Yes. Uh, also, if I don't know if y'all got the email from the same professor, but don't come and talk to me in my office. <laughs> I was a big, I was a big balling dude. I had an office back then. Nice. Well yeah. done. It's more like a closet. Closet. So, office. Uh, on a completely different note, uh, why are you going to Disney? Oh, I'm, I, I'm, I have to. You have to. Oh yeah, I'm being forced. Okay. Yeah. But I am going to dress up like Harry Potter, and Corey brought me a wand, and I'm getting a fanny pack for my birthday. <laughs> That sounds like a fair trade. And some of those five finger shoes, dude. Vibrant five fingers. I had like, some of those, man. I'm going to come back. Next time you see me, dude, I'm going to be wearing five finger shoes in a fanny pack. I had some of those when they first came out. I wore them a bit. This didn't. didn't I'm going to didn't. get some five finger socks. Why do they call them five fingers and not toes? I don't know. I don't know. I've got a high arch, so they never really had good arch support. For me. I cannot fathom where. I, I mean, did, did you wear them barefoot? Yeah. Do they stink? Um, that's what I'm worried about. That's why I'm going to get some like socks that are like ankle socks that are know. just for your toes. Yeah. I don't know. I, they, I didn't have them really for that long. I wore them, I wore them into the floating on the Buffalo river one time and pretty much jacked them up. So, Oh really? Yeah. Damn. You're supposed to be like running them and stuff. Is it like the rocks and stuff or? I don't know. They just didn't, they just got all kind of messed up. I didn't ever wear them again. I threw them away. I was going to ask if you give them to me. No, <laughs> until I until I learned about the the buffalo, but yeah, uh, I'm excited about them. Plus, uh, you know, fanny packs are back. I know. That I don't. You, I don't know that that's true. But I know that you remarked on my capri pants the other day. I did. Those are those are boy. Those are your boy uh, capri pirate pants. pants. You know, they're like cut off sweats. Yeah, of course. Yeah, got them at the Under Armour outlet. They're, uh, they're in jam- the men's department. They're jams. Because yeah. you probably don't remember jams. No, I remember Jinkos though. Yeah. They recently went out of business, by the way. Chinko? Mm-hmm. Rest in peace. Rest in peace. They were so baggy, man. I didn't like the super duper baggy ones, but I liked the baggy pants when I was, you know, going to church with you back in the day. Now you're all into skinny jeans? You know, I did score some skinny pants at Old Navy at the professor sale that we both took advantage of. Did you see those pants by chance? Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't have the body type for skinny jeans. I don't either. They're not. I guess they're not skinny pants, but they are like a slim fit. See, I wear, I wear the the slim straight legs. That's what these are. Yeah. I got like fifteen pair of them in there. They okay. were super on sale. But I noticed when I'm I was like I wore a pair the other day and I was sitting down like this and like behind my knees was like getting yeah. All if you have up uh, weird. yeah, if you have any kind of uh, you know leg. Uh, size to you whatsoever you gotta be you gotta watch the skinny pants yeah yeah like for people with toothpicks so. I do have ch- I do have chicken calves me too fortunately I think we were talking about that the other day we did yeah well uh, so what's next man other than editing the documentary you got uh, you teaching summer classes you got uh, you got a new course you're doing next semester yeah so uh, I'll teach uh, I think I'm teaching intro to soci and intro to criminal justice in the summer if uh, seven people sign up for it I gotta teach summer class that's um, cool you teach criminal justice I don't, I don't yeah, know if I in, knew that intro to criminal justice is the only class it's a fun class uh, yeah it's good I mean it's uh, um, we recently added a uh, criminal justice minor so i teach deviance and intro to criminal justice in that so 
Um, but beyond that, you get ready for summertime and next semester. And do you think? <laughs> quick side note: Did you leverage that Presbyterian guy being a part of a Presbyterian university to get them to say yes to your project? I did not. Well, that's a great coincidence. They were trying to take that stuff away from you. Be like, oh, mirror over here. It's Presbyterian. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, they, just, I just researched the whole history of like uh, Calvinism for, uh, in Europe and the Reformation. So mm-hmm. like, which eventually became Presbyterianism. Did you ever read the uh, Protestant ethic in the spirit of capitalism by uh, Max Weber? No. So it's, I wouldn't recommend reading it. It's really synopsis. It's dense. So the, basically the synopsis is, uh, so Max Weber is one of the, the founding fathers of sociology. He's a really interesting character too. So his parents, uh, he's a, uh, uh, German. His uh, dad was a bureaucrat. His mom was an ardent Calvinist, and so his uh, dad's a bureaucrat, atheist. Mom's an ardent Calvinist. Um, he had a strained relationship with his dad. Uh, he was a part of the uh, intellectual elite. Uh, went to the the you know the special smart kid schools, and uh, he had a big falling out with his dad. And literally the the day of the falling out, his dad dies of a heart attack, and it causes uh, Weber to have a complete mental break, spend some time in a mental institution, uh, gets out of the mental institution, and uh, goes uh, to fight in World War One, and comes back from war and uh, re-enters academia where he writes. Uh, some of the the most influential work in kind of sociology and the study of bureaucracy. And one of the things that he writes is the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism, where he draws comparisons between the rise of Protestantism and the rise of capitalism in Europe and says that they have uh, values that are, uh, uh, that are commensalate. So they basically, uh, that the, the values in Protestantism mirrored the values in capitalism. So they both emerged collectively together and fueled each other. Interesting, man. Yeah. That is. I may, I may look into that a little deeper. Um, I would read synopsis of it, a synopsis of it, but not actually because yeah. you know, he's, it's written, you know, late 1800s. I'm sure somebody's done a podcast on it, dude. G- That's Germany, the world we live in. Yeah, I mean, and uh, so it's been, re- I mean, I've read it before. I don't recommend it. It's not particularly, but it's it's insightful stuff. I got super deep into the Reformation, when I, I which I, I never took the class. I was just telling Dr. Tarver, one of my old mentors yesterday, um, we went and uh, went to the range together. But uh, that I wish I, I took Renaissance and medieval history to try and round out my world history side of things uh, when I was going. I think it was in my undergrad. Uh, it was in my undergrad. I wish I would have taken history, Christianity, and the Reformation. Yeah. Just because it would have, I think it would have served me much more beneficial. Because it's like I took a whole class on the Renaissance and yeah. Yeah, teaching that was real fun. We watched a movie. I phoned in for for the movie that day. Yeah, on YouTube. It's really, uh, you know, I'm I'm kind of uh, the way that I approach sociology is looking at things historically. Many of the like the large macro level theories, you know, like um, you know Marxism or functionalism or structuralism are all kind of predicated on looking at things in their historical place, and so that's kind of the way that I see the world uh, as well. Um, so, you know, looking at things like Protestantism and capitalism emerging at the same period of time in the same place and, um, you know, something like uh, a, an ethic like delayed gratification, for example, how that kind of fosters capitalism because you constantly have a flow of workers that are willing to work. You don't even have to really compensate them that well because they're building up their treasures in heaven and the whole idea of predestined this is all what we have calvinism predestination predestination that we're all in our spots and we should be happy and and then the idea of the doctrine of vocation um right that we're all created by god to work and be um to be uh you know to be inactive is to be sinful so all of these things are are all the the kind of i think he has like 17 different parallels in this really thick uh volume um but each one of them kind of uh fuels capitalism Right. Did you go? Did you get into this in like PhD school or what? Um, no, I mean we talk about Max Weber and in Intro to Soch, but yeah, I mean I, I ended up having to read it in like uh, um, social theory and when you get into. Do you teach sociology or religion? I do. I'm teaching it right now. Yeah. Okay. I thought that, I knew we talked about that recently. Um, that is another class I was uh, sad that I never got to take. If I would have taken that, and there were two classes that I lacked being able to have religious studies minor. 
Yeah, the uh, the the perspective is not about uh, you know confirming or debunking, but more so that the fact that people believe it and that belief is what compels them to behave. Not really the not the, the power author. of Christ compels you. Um, so we just got done talking about uh, the cult sect typology. Did you watch the Wild Wild Country? You told me about that. I haven't had a chance to watch it. Yes. Uh, totally crazy. Like I was super into it and then I saw him having like this crazy, like weird ritualistic, like orgy. So there's supposedly, I don't know if you read any of this stuff. There's supposedly like a Hollywood sex cult that a lot of like uh, young stars. Now we're getting into my area, bro. <laughs> Hollywood sex cults. Yeah. Well, you know, Hollywood in general yeah. and sex in general and cults or the occult. I'm into it. So you know that uh, L. Ron Hubbard was into the occult, right, when he got discharged from the military? Yeah, so um, he actually was a, a member of one of Aleister Crowley's organizations. Yeah. Stole, uh, didn't he steal Aleister Crowley's girl? I don't know about that. I think he stole uh, one, of, her, to look one into of his it. girls. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, um, I have a copy. Um, a friend of mine gave it to me. Um, I saw a friend of mine, I don't know if I told you, is, is, a, is a Scientologist. It's only, I mean, maybe more friends than I, I have are Scientologists. We just never. Is he, is he wealthy? He's successful. Okay. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's he their attributes, model. I think he attributes success to uh, some of the stuff that he kind of picked up from Scientology, but he, uh, he gave me um, a copy of Dianetics and uh, I was just kind of flipping through it, but it is crazy how much um, Hubbard surveyed a bunch of people that I'm sure you surveyed in grad school, according to his writings and stuff, Kant, and like a whole bunch of people from the Enlightenment I just lectured on. Mm -hmm. I was He was drawing a bunch of parallels. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, I've seen a lot of the, uh, I've actually seen all of the anti-Scientology stuff out there. Mm -hmm. All the Louis Thoreau going clear all the Leah Romini stuff um, all the Marty Rathbun stuff and I did get to have like several hours of conversation with it and I think that I think that a lot of stuff that we know about it is, is super negative I, I'm not I'm not saying it has its redeeming qualities it's a, it's pretty out there the more I learn about it but like it's it's kind of been a struggle for me because I, I will say that this friend of mine is like one of the nicest people I know it's it's no less bizarre than any other religious belief that's what I mean yeah without with fear of being judged I mean yes. if you want to be real honest about it I mean the idea that we still are inhabited by uh, you know spirits of uh, dead aliens is is no less bizarre than the idea that somebody would die and be raised from the dead yeah well I mean dude Xenu the intergalactic Overlord, it's. I mean, Zena, or, it's, it uh, and, does, and, you know, and there's a lot of other. Yeah, I was just thinking yeah, about that. I'm objectively like, speaking, that's no less bizarre than believing that uh, if you or I pass away right now, we could be reincarnated as a gnat. I mean, or what? Like Joe Rogan's been talking about this. What if you just relived your like like Groundhog Day for life? Like not like you relive the same day. Mm -hmm. You relived your same life. Yeah, I mean that's a, that's a, that's one of the beliefs of. Um, God, who is it was talking about that? One of the one of the the science people. Um, I mean, I, I meet tons of people that think that like they don't really um, they don't really believe you get re, uh, reincarnated as a different like I guess uh, a different like a tree or <laughs> yeah. Well, if you get into any of like the uh, uh, the the multiple parallel universes theory. I was just talking a little bit about string theory mm. and uh, the evolution of consciousness and uh, the enlightenment. And uh, I was getting that enlightenment lecture the other day and uh, it got a little off track. It does that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you, um, it's, it's just, it comes down to uh, how socially acceptable or unacceptable the beliefs are to larger society. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, that's it. Like, see, well, the, what I'm fascinated by is uh, minority religions. You know, mm -hmm. like, um, or just like religions, like I was like, we were talking about Protestantism and the rise of Protestantism in Europe. Like, what about um, religions that had just have come about either as reinventions of Protestant uh, denominations that came out of Europe in the Reformation or that were founded even after the, you know, the United States, so like Mormonism and Scientology. That's very interesting to me. Well, that's the, that's the whole thing I just, 
talked about in class, the cult sect typology, right? So the, the big difference between a cult and a sect is that a sect is a, a splinter uh, or a, a group that, that breaks off of a, an established group, right? And this is where we get all of the Protestant groups uh, from, you know, Baptist and Methodist. And the Baptist. All of them, right? They're all yeah. different sectarian groups. And so they kind of have an established belief system. A cult just represents a new religious movement that kind of starts on its own. And at various points in the evolution of an organization, a sect can jump to be a cult and a cult can jump to be a sect, depending on the level of social acceptability. And so you have uh, something like Scientology that begins as a cult and then becomes an established cult. And it becomes an established cult when the, uh, the charismatic leader passes away and the group continues because that's one of the big kind of indicators of uh, a group becoming institutionalized so it can it can continue after the leader is gone uh with a sect like christianity there you go well christianity is tep- t- uh, technically a sect that splinters off of judaism right yeah and so but mormonism is a really good example of one that started as it was not really associated with any other denomination so it started kind of as a as a cult and then became established so you have joseph smith getting gunned down in in illinois and then brigham young picking up the mantle and then around like what is it 1919 utah wants to become part of the united states and so they strike a deal with the u.s uh, government uh to come on board about the same time that the uh the president of the the church decides that polygamy is no longer a good idea um and so at that point you know you have mormonism jumped over to become a a denomination um and then you have other groups that will jump over so you can look at the you know the snake handlers in kentucky i joke about that all the time man praise the lord and pass me a copperhead right and so it just depends on the level of social acceptability that you know whether we how we classify them um so anyway we, we digress, not national parks related in any way, shape, or form. Unless you think that going to a national park is a religious experience, which I've seen some cool stuff. Yeah, well, you know, I've had way more what I would, uh, like we talked to recently on one of the podcasts about prayer. Uh, mm-hmm. Like when it was a big conversation about prayer and about how, I just told him, I was like, um, you know, I never heard anyone on the other end of the telephone, but a lot of people say they do. Uh, I'm just going to throw up a video on the the TV real quick. I've been like trying to raise awareness to this and I'm not I like, and two, I kind of feel bad for like throwing shade or, or, um, or whatever. I don't know what you want to, what you want to say, but man, you ever seen that video of Benny Hinn whipping people with his coat? <laughs> Benny okay. Hinn's really interesting. Okay, so we don't even have to put it up. No, I know all about Benny Hinn. But man, there's just like this big video out there of him just like whipping people with his coat. Mm-hmm. And they're just, you know, and that, um, people talk so illy of something like Scientology. And it's like, but there's that level of control going on. <coughs> or whatever you want to call it. I'm not trying to throw shade Benny Hinn's way or say he's a charlatan or anything. I don't know. I remember when I was a kid, my dad watched him on TBN and um, I know he's still around. And like back then, that's kind of how I was raised. I was raised in this Pentecostal church and stuff. And then now as an adult, I'm like, no, I'm, I'm, you know, we've, we've had this conversation off air and kind of where I am is, uh, you know, just to give you, which we don't have to go down some super religious rabbit hole here. No, it doesn't. I mean, so, uh, so I was, when I was born, my parents were Catholic, right? And so I went through Catholicism up until, so I was baptized Catholic. I went through my first communion. Uh, I went to a Catholic school. Were you an altar boy? I was an altar boy. Yes. And then, so my parents left Catholicism when I was like in third or fourth grade. Why? They decided they wanted to be like uh, straight up Pentecostal hand raising, dancing in the uh, aisles, uh, speaking, speaking in, in tongues. tongues, man. Uh, so for me, Right, as a third or fourth grader going from Catholicism, which is super ritualized, super conservative, like full on, you know, stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, sign of the cross, we're done, uh, to, you know, three hour Sunday 
sermons where people are you know in the aisles my, my dad had a giant album collection we took it out to a cotton field and he uh, doused it with propane or uh, uh not propane um uh, lighter fluid yeah. and burned them we had a giant bonfire of albums right we weren't allowed to listen to any secular music for a good portion of yeah. my life. so there's that and then and then they kind of lessened their stance on that and we went to methodist churches and baptist churches and, and i went to you know lutheran churches and just i've been to all kinds of churches um so that's my background right and so you know my perspective is is that uh is uh people believe what they believe they believe all kinds of bizarre things and i leave room for that but i feel like if there if there is a god then there has to be multiple paths to that thing that are not necessarily just limited to one and that's always been my issue with any kind of absolutist belief is that it brings you in real sharp contrast to all other beliefs that are also absolutist and that's troubling right so, I mean, you know, believe in Scientology, believe in New Age, believe in, uh, you know, be a Mormon, be a, a Baptist, whatever. But, you know, you have to leave room for other people and their other beliefs. Exactly. I mean, I'm sitting here like, so, you know, your, uh, your family's process of like going through all that probably allowed them to arrive at some place where they could be or you or whoever, even if it's not in that generation to like uh I don't know. For me, a lot of it is, is about consciousness and it's like, uh, being able to get to a point is a person, which I'm not there hundred percent at all to where you're just like, man, I, I, I just like right now. I have a very agnostic point of view. I'm like, Hey, I don't know. And guess what? You don't either. And I'm never going to believe that you do. Yeah. I, I, uh, I believe people believe they know. Yeah, I mean, that's... And and it's in that belief that that compels the behavior. And I see a lot of really negative behavior come out of that absolutist belief. Yes. And I can't, uh, for a long time... Absolutism, man. Yeah, for a long time, I was able to kind of bifurcate my perspective and keep my intellectual um, life separate from my uh, spiritual life. But then I came to a point where you just can't live those separate lives and see that way. And I think it came to the point where my kids were old enough to, where I had a very specific way that I wanted to raise my kids. And, um, it wasn't consistent to the places that were available for that sort of behavior. Like the churches that we had gone to, um, I didn't, I didn't like what they were telling my, my daughters about the place of women, for example in the in society i didn't like that i didn't i don't raise my my daughters that way and so you know in the absence of finding a place that uh, or a group of people that believe consistently i just don't believe man it was funny uh hayden was uh how we were doing odd men out in jiu-jitsu the other day and like all the kids came and sat on the walls like what'd you learn in social studies class today <laughs> And like their range of answers was like all over the place. The American Revolution. Uh, I'm writing a paper over this girl that was a spy in the revolution. Like a lot of them were working on the American Revolution. And then uh, Hayden comes over and sits down. She's like, mutualism, determinism. I was just like, are you an AP? And she's like, yeah. I was like, get out of here. <laughs> but she, I was like, her answers were like, Whoa. Yeah, here. they're smart kids, man. She's she's uh, next weekend. She's taking the ACT test, right? The how is she's what twelve? Thirteen. She'll be thirteen in June, so she's twelve. Yeah, Hayden will be thirteen. Mm -hmm. Wow. So is she gonna move up to teen class? You think? I guess Cora sent hey, a message not too long ago that she was gonna move like uh, a few of the the older kids mm -hmm. up to the teen class. Well, and two, I don't know what this does for you guys, but one of our only moves we have left to make in terms of programs that we're going to be doing in probably three months is starting a teen jujitsu class. Is there, is there one? No, no, I didn't but there's there teen was. MMA. Okay. So, and two, um, she, she can keep coming to jujitsu as long as she wants in the meantime. Yeah. Cause it's not like she's a giant man. Sierra is such a good, there's so many people, Laney dude, Laney's younger than she is. Yeah. How crazy is that? Yeah. And we had to move Laney up to teen class. Cause it's just like, you, you're bigger than Cora. Yeah. She is. It's insane. Um, but, uh, but that's going to be one of the next moves we make. Like what we probably, what we're going to do is add a little teen jiu-jitsu class in, uh, where our judo's at or they're in about, 
on Tuesday, Thursday, mm. and uh, do judo on the weekends on Saturday. So, well, well, we'll make it work. So, yeah, well, um, definitely. Um, she is a phenom with jujitsu, and we're, we're that's that's it. We have so many kids, like uh, used to. I mean, you see our kids for our teen program now. It has about twelve to fifteen students that come to every class. Like for the longest time, we had like five. Yeah. And like we finally broke through with that market, and now what we have is we have so many kids in that twelve and under bracket that are like been with us for a long time and that are getting older. It's just uh, what you know organically from our own crowd we have a big team program mm -hmm. so because i mean like devin and so many kids that are close to Aiden's age or arliss are ready to move up so we're gonna all of them will kind of all those yellow belts and and stuff that kind of well how old is owen now owen's just 11 yeah yeah they're both uh both growing up dude i know we just still have the oreo babe Dude, I meant to like bring you an Oreo. I had some Oreos in there, and I was gonna make a joke about Alice and Oreos. And well, you know, she's real shy, but she uh, she it's one of her highlights. She doesn't like it when we don't go to when we don't go to martial arts. That's funny. That's yeah. funny. It, Cora Cora loves that going over and talking to her and stuff. <laughs> I, I can't remember what she did the other day. It was something like uh, I asked her something about is okay if if uh, me and Mister Brian are married or something. I don't remember what yeah. she asked her, but she was like, no. no. Forget about that. Yeah, dude. To be that age, man. Uh, one of my one of my friends. Do you have cats? No, not a cat person, dude. Come on now. You got a dog? I got a dog. He's terrible. My dog's kind of terrible too. He's a child though. But uh, one of my uh, previous podcast guests and I were like, uh, at some point when we were growing up, we established that we like. I said something to him. He said something to me about getting pissed off at our cats when we like had to go to school or like go to college or something. Our cats just laying around sleeping all day, living the life that we wanted to live at the time. And uh, then we were like, "Oh, to sleep, just to sleep." Yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> Man, I like sleeping just does not like it. Still matters to Cora. This shit don't matter to me <laughs> anymore. It changes, man. I uh, I had to. Uh when we got back from the trip because on the trip I was the last one asleep and the first one up every morning and mm -hmm. so I did that for 10 days did you like cook breakfast or anything when you were camping or yeah what? I mean we did we did all the cooking the students planned all the trips and uh, what we were going to eat and everything so we did everything uh, but I, I mean I just needed to make sure that I was up and everything was going we were getting on the road and uh, but when we got back, man, I was exhausted for like a week. Like I couldn't do anything. I didn't. I didn't work out. I didn't do anything. I basically went to work, and then went to sleep. And it took me a week to recover. Yeah. No, I can only imagine. Uh, anytime I go, damn, which I've never done anything like that. But anytime I go out on the road for like a week or drive to Vegas and do a conference, I mean, cause I've done that a couple of times, or fly anywhere, and you're you're doing something there for three or four days, and you fly back, and then it's right back into the freaking fire of normal life. Just you know, it's uh, it's definitely. That's why I'm a little more open. I am somewhat open to going to Disney or whatever, just to like have days where you don't do anything. Yeah. Other than cool stuff, like I'm going to see a Panic concert in Memphis here pretty soon. There you go. You want to go, bro? I don't. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. I got to turn you on to him before before we're done. No, that was that was doesn't resonate with me, unfortunately. Well, did you say you like the Almond Brothers? They're okay. I'm not a huge like Southern rock band. Like. I listen to the Allman Brothers. I, you know, Skinner's okay. Um, you know. Uh, did, you ever, did you ever get into Drive By Truckers? Were we talking about? Yeah, them? I mean, I, I downloaded a couple of their songs. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I don't know. I, I have a really eclectic. I mean, I've got like four thousand songs on my phone, and so they're of all different types of genres. And yeah, too. I'm, I'm hard to peg down to any one thing. I just, it's got a. It's got to resonate with me somehow, and, and if I, it does. I, different days, I'm in different moods, and so you know, before classes, I always play music in class. And what uh, what's some of the stuff that you? Uh, what's some of your top your tops your favorite bands? Uh, just uh, that's such a hard question. That's like a podcast in and of itself. Yeah, you know, we could have you for a music unraveled episode. We could do that. I, I have uh, you know like some of that. Well, you're into vinyl, yeah. I do like some vinyl. I like the the popping and the cracking. So uh, let's see. Let me look here. Bring out my phone here. Got my songs. 
Let's see. Uh, you know who uh, Big Audio Dynamite is? So they were the the kind of the offshoot of the Clash. Really? Um, Some of the same uh, same members? Yeah, Joe uh, Strummer? Or? Joe, I don't think Joe Strummer's in the band. Uh, let's see what else I got here. So you like a little punk roots? I like a little punk roots. I got some. Uh, you know, Seven Mary Three. Yes. Uh, Stevie Wonder. We've got. Uh, you, I like Yes. You like Yes? Uh, you know, I couldn't tell you any of the songs. Cage the Elephant. ZZ yeah, Top. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've got. Uh, I got Red Hot Chili Peppers. Doctor Dre. Doctor uh, Dre. What's your favorite Dre song? Um. So my ringtone is. Uh, let me play my ringtone for you. It is, uh, it is, um, damn, big audio dynamite had like two, three, four, five, six, nine albums. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the song that you know most is the, uh, it sounds a little bit, excuse, we should just, you need to play this all the time. Let me see here. So, this is my, this is my ringtone. yeah dude that's gangster man <laughs> i'm so impressed that that's your ringtone that's man my, i'm not gonna ringtone. lie um but I, yeah. I listen to all kinds of stuff man i've got the marvelettes here i've got herman's hermits adele i like the who a lot i love the foo fighters man uh yeah they were uh do you go to concerts yeah, when I can. I mean, just... Uh, Foo Fighters are playing in Shreveport uh, uh, here in a few weeks. Yeah, uh, Fall Out Boy, Sly and the Family Stone. I've got some Johnny Mathis, the Rolling Stones, Mumford and Son, uh, Kenny Rogers, the Zombies, Public Enemy. We did... Uh, you, you get in the Avid Brothers very much? We did a podcast about them. Uh, uh, you know, the, I've, one of the things that I haven't gotten really into is like the whole bluegrass mandolin kind of... The closest yeah. I get to that is like... Uh, some Mumford the, and Sons. Mumford and Sons and some of the old like uh, uh, country stuff that I listen to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not super big into country, but I will, I'll throw down on some Garth Brooks, dude. Some Lone Star. I'm um, trying to think if there's Chris Ledoux, else. this cowboy's hat. You know that one? Mm-mm. Um, Stur- you listen to Sturgill Simpson. I've been getting into him a little bit. A little bit. So he, he opened for uh, GNR, right? Uh, yeah, uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, he did. Yeah, when they were in Little Rock. Every time, you know how I even found out who Sturgill Simpson was is um, going to Panic concerts. Oh, yeah? There's always people there that are wearing this shirt that says, who the fuck is Sturgill Simpson? <laughs> you know, I, I can't get into like a lot of the... the uh, psychedelic themes. No, I like the psychedelic themes. Me too. I, I, I dig I, honestly, psychedelic But music. that is a point like, uh, cause a Sturgill Simpson is in panic, uh, too, a little bit at times or, uh, singing about crazy psychedelic experiences. That's, I mean, that's the best music comes from turtles Paris, all right? the way down. Um, no, I can't get into like, uh, some of the new pop music right now. You know, like uh, what, like that Demi Lovato song? You don't like that? I don't know. No, I don't either. They, they do. like, I know Demi Lovato from her days on the Disney Channel, and so that's a little weird for me. She does jujitsu now. I'm so sick of hearing about it <laughs> uh, because it's all uh, it's just all um, all I hear about all the jujitsu pages. It, like, and she keeps doing stuff with jujitsu, not competing, just making videos. Yeah, giving them fodder for the headlines. People are just blowing up this this status I made here. I'm gonna see if I can tell you how many uh, comments it had. Um, let's see. I was. It's the one where I, I'm, I shared the UFC. 62 comments. <laughs> so far. So you you are you got a more active social media presence than I do, uh, dude. I'm pretty active on Facebook, but that's not. That makes you know what yeah. that makes you it just makes you old. Yeah, that's what I've been told. Hey, did you see this one? That movie? Find the difference in the two pictures. The bingo. I saw it first thing. Yeah. So that, that was above your waist. That doesn't count. But grandma's waist. No, is that's the thing. Although the uh, I did share the uh, the Italy one. With that my was dad. good, right? I got him. That was good. My buddy was going through some hard times yesterday that I um, I mentioned and uh, I uh, I sent him that and I was just like just trying to lighten the mood, bro. And he was because we're talking, and he's like, "Dude, B, what are you doing?" And I was just like, "I'm sorry, I'm sorry." Back on track here, man. You need anything? So, well, dude, uh, let's go ahead and uh, I guess wrap it up, man. Thanks right. for. Uh, oh, wait, 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 wait. So, 
we didn't get on this. What's, we'll do this as a BRS topic. What's going on with the reduction of national parks in the United States? So this is uh, this is under the uh, the current uh, administration. Um, they are reexamining a lot of policies and procedures and how to manage public lands. And so one of the first things that uh, they have looked at was uh, uh, some of the uh, national monuments. So the thing about national monuments is that they don't require an act of Congress like a national park does, right? So with a national mm-hmm. park, it has to go through the uh, House and the Senate <laughs> and then be signed into law by the president. Uh, national monuments is uh, a play on the Antiquities Act. And so what it does is it gives the power of the president to designate certain lands as public and protected. And so uh, there are several areas, a couple of them in Utah, uh, but also uh, places go, up. Did you go there? I've been to both of those places. Yeah, uh, Bear Ears National Monument, which was reduced by 80%. And then the Escalante Grand Staircase National Monument, which was, uh, I think it was cut by only 30%. Why are they cutting it for oil? They are, uh, they're opening it up for, uh, they're opening up for multi-use. But one of the biggest things is that they're doing mineral prospecting. What, are they going to do like fracking and stuff, you think? It's going to open it up to whatever, right? So uh, on February 2nd, I think, is when uh, it came, it went into law when they reduced those. Um, uh, they had a, a record number of uh, claims made to the Bureau of Land Management for, uh, for um, um, prospecting. And so they're going to go in there, uh, and Bear Ears is especially troubling because Bear Ears is a is a uh, is a cultural monument. So it's uh, it's basically from I think it's the uh, Anasazi and the Pueblo Indians. There are uh, there are cliff dwellings, there are uh, archaeological places, uh, archaeological sites um, that will never be discovered, that will never be um, uh, cultivated, that won't be uh, uh, preserved because we're too busy. Um, basically raping the land for the uh, resources. There's been uh, there's been discussion about uh, allowing mining in places like Yellowstone, and uh, when we start doing that, um, these places that are important are gonna they're gonna go away. Um, so it's a uh, it's a uh, it's there's precedence for it, but not in the scale that it has been and the Trump administration. So it's really troubling when you start doing that. Have there been any other administrations in the last 34 years that have done similar, similar things? I think that they're, uh, so the Clinton administration was the one that designated the grand staircase and it was really controversial. Uh, and I understand it because they, they basically took this big chunk of land in South Utah and they said, you know, you can't use it anymore. And and a lot of uh, people lost their, uh, lost their livelihood. There were a lot of folks that were into uh, like cattle ranching, and they were just doing free range grazing. Um, government said they couldn't do that anymore. So there's a lot of resentment um, on the kind of on the local level, and it was probably not as vetted as well as as it could have been. Uh, but yeah, I mean we've we've uh, we've gone back on national monuments before, but not for this express purpose, and not on the scale that it's we're looking at it right now. I'm going to have to uh, hit up my buddy uh, who's a geography professor about yeah. some of this because he um, was thinking about him while you were talking earlier. He's created a, a, some courses over the years like uh, Place and Collective Memory and um, uh, Monuments and, mm-hmm. and has worked a lot with that as a topic. And I got into that and wrote a paper over um, Holocaust monuments mm-hmm. in the Geography Europe class I took him with. So... I wonder what his take would be on some of that. Because uh, he's like a monuments expert, I feel mm-hmm. like. Well, you know, we make monuments to memorialize and to preserve. And, um, you know, when we start looking at a map of the United States, how many actual protected places there are, they're getting fewer and further between. Um, and it makes it that much more important for us to, to continue to... Um, to take care of and to continue to maintain those places. And especially at the same time as we're seeing some of this change in federal government and the way that we're treating public lands, because the whole idea of having a national park or a national monument or a national forest is that it collectively belongs to the American people, right? It doesn't belong to one entity. Um, it belongs to everybody. And so there's a legacy of that, of the people that preserved it before for us. And there's a responsibility for us to preserve it for the next generation. Um, but at the same time that they're doing that, they're also making all kinds of cuts and funding to the National Park Service 
so that it's uh, having the impact of having to raise the cost of fees to get into the parks, uh, which has the effect of uh, shutting off access to the parks to people that are in a lower so, so lower socio demographic area, yeah. and so it's this this like this trickle down effect of okay, if people have to stop going to the national parks they're going to stop interacting in these wild places and thinking they're important and then making decisions when they vote uh, or when they empower their legislatures yeah, to do that and so it's like it almost seems like it's a conspiracy to, to it is. create a situation so we can just rip the, every resource out of the land that we possibly can and it's concerning and it's I think it's it's very troubling for me Man, yeah, yeah. Did you get into this in your class any yet? Have you? Uh, yeah, I we've mean, I know it's just it, it's just you know, going on. But you're there, I mean, there have been other times in American history that we've looked at that, like uh, during World War II. Um, there was a lot of very serious discussions about taking uh, established national parks and then using the timber and the mineral resources for the war effort, but we didn't make that decision. And my feeling is, is if we didn't make that decision during World War II, seems like in 2018 we shouldn't be making that decision when we're just trying to make our gas you know, a couple cents cheaper or to be able to produce uh, some of our trinkets and our doodads for a couple of cents less. You know what I mean? It seems like a, a really big price to pay. Yeah. Well, so, and I mean, so I wonder, I wonder if the generations and decades of us like um, extrapolating those resources from the Middle East and elsewhere have um, like now, now we just have to <laughs> start resort, uh, resorting to our own in a sad way, you know, or, or, or we could start investigating and uh, seriously investing in alternative energy. Um, instead of uh, instead of making it more difficult, let's make it. So one of the coolest things that I saw is uh, in some of the places between uh, Oklahoma City and Amarillo, Texas, that were, uh, you know, were the the oil capitals of Texas before it all dried up. Uh, they're transitioning to to wind power. Windmills, yeah. I and saw one of those on fire the other day. Did you yeah, see that? I did not yeah, see somebody it. Somebody unfortunately passed away. And well. you go out west, and you also see giant giant solar farms. You know, it's a solar farm in Clarksville where you teach. It's now. really cool, man. And um, uh, under this current administration, they're making those things less able to compete in the marketplace because of uh, because of regulations that are being passed and because of uh, um, tax breaks that are be being given to fossil fuels. And it's all it's all about it's all about lining the pockets of people who already have a lot of money. And all you have to do is is drive across uh, West Texas through that forty or fifty mile stretch between um, you know West Texas and uh, El Paso, uh, almost into New Mexico, and you'll see these uh, oil fields um, and the towns that that are kind of in between these oil fields, and it it's just it looks dead, and there's this filthy smell, and I can't imagine living there. Uh, and then when you finally leave that and go to an actual vibrant ecosystem where you see greens and browns and you see things blooming and growing, uh, you understand that we are we're killing the planet that we live on. You know? Yeah. So, Sadly. yeah, I mean, so that's that's where I am with that. Uh, but uh, my biggest recommendation is, you know, go see your state parks, go see your national parks, go see your national monuments, your national forest. All you have to do is, you know, drive 60 miles north of where we are right now and go check out the Buffalo National River, oh, which so beautiful. was, I mean, it's still currently being threatened by the fact that we have large scale animal operations in the watershed, you know, um, decisions that are being made and they call it, uh, you know, making ourselves Arkansas being economically viable, but there are other ways that we can do that. So, uh, but yeah, I think that uh, I believe that if people go and see these places and have these experiences, then they'll, um, you know, it'll impact the way that they they behave and the way that they vote. So um, go check out the the wild places and see wilderness before it's gone. Yeah, man, that's just like the the big thing I'm thinking is like. Oh, the way that's headed, the way you just described it, is uh, when people like you are no longer voting, we're gonna have some issues. Well, that's you know that's also part of the reason why you teach a class like this right and why i take my kids to these places make a difference just to you know um to have that fond memory and to remember you know those experiences and see those places firsthand not in a picture but firsthand um 
and it'll be in, you know, then maybe they'll take their kids or maybe they'll go back or, you know, whatever, go work for an organization, an institution that'll, uh, whether it's an environmental organization or the National Park Service or Fish and Wildlife or, you know, go into environmental law or any of those things. I think that, uh, you know, you can, um, what's the saying? You can uh, think globally and act locally. So mm. that's that's where I'm at with that. No, nah, man, I want to go to National Park right now. Check it out. We got one just south of here, Hot Springs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not quite as awesome as the other ones, but it's a national park nonetheless. Is... um. So what would Petty Jean qualify as? Petty Jean's a state park. State park. And Arkansas is really lucky because we have a really uh, well-funded uh, state park system. And they're, uh, most of them are really in good shape, and they're free in Arkansas. Yeah. That's not the case in other places. So, Yeah. And well, that's because we've, we've put a premium on those places, and they're important to us. I guess they only charge like to camp and stuff. Yeah, but typically. the entrance fee. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but um, yeah, you can go launch into the uh Iponka right now into the buffalo and that's not gonna cost you anything no it's not better go do that while the water's up check it out i know yeah i uh, Corey and i uh, when we were coming back from the range yesterday uh, which is out like north of dover or yeah it's north of dover and uh we passed a ton of people going out to the creek it's because it's been it's been raining, man, and it's uh, the water's flowing. It's usually not flowing this time of year, so yeah. If when the sun finally, because yesterday the sun finally came out, and there were people yeah. people head out to the creek. We're right on, dude. Well, thanks for your time. <laughs> thanks uh, for having me. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, good times. We uh, we we dealt with Star Wars in, in depth last time. National parks this time. We went all over the place. We kind of meandered, but that's all right. Hey, and there's always next time. There we go. All right, man. Have a good day. Thank you. <laughs>